Hi, everyone. So welcome to today's live. We're going to be looking at anything football fitness related, anything football strength conditioning related. Um, I know sometimes you get some questions in around nutrition and psychology and injuries as well. So if they're quite broad, I might be able to help. But let's try and keep everything really specific in terms of football fitness. OK, so we've got a few questions coming in already. So let's look at a very current one. So how to main fitness while in a 14 day quarantine um, for, with a trial straight after. So this one's really, really tough. And I think the mindset you need to look at it with is how can you be as fit as possible considering the situation rather than being how can you be as fit as possible um, just in general? Because obviously, you know that if you're stuck in a hotel room and literally not able to leave, then you're not going to be as good as you possibly could be physically. But that doesn't mean that you can't work around that. So the first things first is there's a, a great home program that we put together uh, not that long ago that's on the Match Fit Squad. So it takes care of any strength and power needs with just your body weight. So that would be a great start. And I think it was four sessions a week on that. So that will keep you quite busy as well. Um, what you're going to lack in a quarantine situation is that running based fitness, basically, and obviously work with the ball. So assuming that you have a ball, obviously anything you can do in a small space is great to keep that first touch sharp and make sure you're ready footballing wise. Um, from a running perspective, you're going to struggle. So I've seen there's different quarantine situations around the world, obviously. And depending on where you are, you might be able to have a bit more leniency. But I've seen people who have bought or rented bikes or bought or rented treadmills or even walking pads, which just go pretty slow, but even can, can keep you walking. So I would definitely try and invest in some equipment if you can. Um, if you can't get a treadmill, that would be, be my first choice. I'd go for a bike. And then with that, you can do any basically any conditioning program that you could normally do or any stamina program you could normally do. You could still do it, but you could just do it on a bike or a treadmill. So I know that's a pretty ideal situation for a quarantine, uh, a quarantine camp or, or a hotel. So if you can get your hands on that type of equipment, then definitely do your best to. I would break the bank to get a bike in if I'm quarantine, quarantining for for two weeks. So home program is on the match fit squad and try and get some equipment um, comment below if you're not going to be able to have any equipment and I can try and help a little bit more, but your options are going to be fairly limited. Okay. Like I said, just approach it to be the best that you can be in the situation and don't try and stress about what it could be. Okay. So should you foam roll or use a massage gun on your semi membranosus or tendinosus? So if anyone doesn't know, it's just two of the three hamstring muscles. So from left to right or from outside to inside, I should say, um, we have biceps femoris, semi-tendinosis in the middle and semi-membranosis um, on the right side of that. That's if you're looking at your left leg. OK, but it doesn't really matter that much. OK, so should you foam roll those muscles or use a massage gun? Uh, of course, you can. There's no reason why you can't foam roll or use a massage gun on any muscle group that there is, okay, or in any muscle. There's no secret muscle group that you're not allowed to, uh, to foam roll, and there's no great muscle group or great area that you have to foam roll, okay? So really, you're not limited at all. If a muscle feels like it's a little bit re restricted or a little bit tight, there's no reason that you can't uh, massage or use, the, use a gun. So nothing's off limits, so there's no reason you can't do that. Go for it, no problems. Okay, so this question is about training with face masks. So I'm assuming we're talking about um, actual face masks that have been designed to help your fitness rather than face masks that we have to wear to stop transmitting the virus. So we've got an article on this. If you want to look more into it after, just Google match fit conditioning and training with face masks, and I'm sure it will come up. So it's a really simple one. They were sold at, the, at first as kind of altitude training masks and that they would somehow be able to replicate training at altitude. And that simply wasn't true. And due to good marketing and obviously sending certain players face masks, and I'm sure with nice sponsorship deals, this kind of spread throughout the footballing community. Uh, there's, no, there's no real 
uh, transfer in terms of training at altitude with a mask, if you know what I mean. So altitude training works. Training with a face mask doesn't work in the same way. So what a face mask does do is make it harder to breathe, which is fairly obvious. And that can help improve the strength of some of your respirator respiratory muscles. Um, so it can have like a knock-on effect that could be positive. But to be honest, it's going to make your training much, much harder. And potentially you're going to be training at lower intensities. So if you want to make your training harder, obviously you can throw on a face mask and do the same thing. And that will be harder. But you can always run further or run faster or run further within a certain time period. So there's no reason why you can't make your training harder without a, a face mask. So it's not something that I would recommend putting into your training if it's not something you have already. If you do have it and you love wearing it and you think it's great for you, then obviously feel free. Um, but it's not something I would say every footballer needs to go out and buy right now. There's definitely much better ways and much more cost effective ways of improving your fitness um, than wearing a face mask. OK, so are there any isometric uh, exercises for glute? And I think IT bands or adductors or abductors. So you can do isometrics for any movement or any muscle group. There's no reason why you can't do those things. Um, commonly used and useful isometric exercises are a glute bridge with a pause at the top. So you can hold at the top in a double leg glute bridge for about 30 seconds. And if that's easy, you can switch to single leg. That's going to make sure that you have really good strength in your glutes and good control, especially in the single leg variation. Um, a useful exercise is for your adductors. So your groin muscles are Copenhagen planks, and they basically involve having one foot, the top foot on a bench or in someone's hand and squeezing both feet together to bring your body up. So if you don't know what that exercise is, just go and Google Copenhagen plank and it'll be there. It's a groin uh, prehab and rehab exercise. That's really useful. And instead of progressing the, um, the number of reps with Copenhagen planks, what I'll do is I will go to long holds. So instead of just coming up and down and up and down in like a scissor type motion, I'll go up and hold for at least five seconds and come back down. Um, that's just a good two good exercises, two examples. There's no reason why you can't do many different uh, isometrics. Calf isometrics can be really useful as can um, isometrics for the knee in terms of a, a rehab setting as well. So that can really help with Achilles tendonitis or um, patella tendonitis for the knee as well. So isometric exercises are definitely an option. But what I would say is the way you need to approach anything in your training is you decide what you're trying to achieve and what adaptation you want to occur. So you might say, I want to improve my strength. And then from that, you judge, okay, well, what training method do I need to, to use to get here? And then you bring those two things together. I would never start from, okay, I want to do isometrics or I want to do eccentrics or I want to do backflips or whatever it is. Always start with what the end point is and then you can reverse engineer backwards. That's definitely a way to approach your training. It's definitely the way to approach even tactical and technical um, things you're trying to achieve on the pitch. What's the end product? I want it to look like this or I want to be this. And then what is the best way to achieve that? And that's going to make everything so much clearer and so much more efficient as well. So, yeah, there's lots of exercises, lots of options. But I would always question why you want to do why you want to do a certain method or why you want to use a certain type of training. Okay, so this one's about patella tendonitis. So um, we just touched on isometrics. And obviously, Jared's going to be on at some point to talk about um, injuries a little bit more. So please come back when Jared's on and he'll go into more details. Like I mentioned, Spanish squat isometrics are really useful for this. But definitely speak to Jared and he can give you so much detail. I'm sure on the MatchFit squad, he recently gave someone quite a lengthy explanation of how to uh, how to adapt their training and what to add into their training as well to help with this. So please either jump in the match fit squad or wait for Jared to be on and he'll be able to answer this in so much more detail than I would be able to. So please come back when Jared's here. And that's the same for anything that comes in in terms of injuries as well. Okay, so we got a question around recovery. So do you think ice baths are worth it? 
I think ice baths have been shown in the research to work. Um, they can reduce markers of muscle damage, which is really useful. And they can improve performance um, when there's a short turnaround in terms of the amount of games or the amount of training you have. If they're easy to set up and it's not like you have to go 100 miles to get ice and it's really expensive where you are, then ice baths can definitely be really useful. So general recommendation is 10 degrees for 10 minutes. I think I, I butchered that and got confused last week. So I'm pleased it came up again. Um, 10 degrees for 10 minutes is the recommendation. So that's not ridiculously cold. Often you'll see people in ice baths that's literally all ice and you're basically torturing yourself for no further benefit. So they can help with short-term recovery. They probably will blunt long-term adaptation. If you feel really sore because you've done 100 sets of bench press today and you jump in an ice bath, you might feel better the next day, but you might get less muscle growth because you've essentially blunted the signal to the body that it needs to recover and repair. So we have an article on this. So type in cold water immersion, um, match fit conditioning into Google. You just find it on, on the blog and you'll find a lot of information about this. OK, because obviously I can tell you 10 degrees for 10 minutes and you can run away and do it every single day. But that might not suit the overall purpose of what you're trying to achieve in a training session or a training week. And if you're in preseason, you might decide to not use them. And if you're during the season and you have a game every three days, you might use them. So there's a lot of nuance to it. You don't want to just jump in an ice bath every day. They're definitely worth it. But if you want to check out the article that we have and it goes into a lot more detail. OK, so is it too early to have a six pack from 12 years old and can it cause ab problems? So I don't think that having a six pack at any time is a problem or not having a six pack at any time is your is a problem. Um, as a player under 18, I really wouldn't worry about body composition. So it doesn't matter how much fat you have or how lean you are at this stage because you're growing. And really, you want to be playing the game for the joy of playing the game because it's fun and because you enjoy improving. So when you think like that, you wouldn't need to think about your body composition unless you're at the point where it's unhealthy, either with a really, really low body fat or really, really high body fat. So you can definitely ask Sean about this in more detail, but I really wouldn't worry about if you do have a six pack or if you don't have a six pack. I'm sure everyone's probably seen a like a training video of a six year old kid who has a six pack. Uh, it won't cause you ab problems. It's ne not necessarily healthy or unhealthy. It just depends how much body fat you happen to have. And if you're naturally, if you naturally have a very low body fat, then your abs might show up. Doesn't mean your abs are really strong or you're superhuman. And same thing, if you have a little bit more body fat as a youth athlete and you can't see your abs, it doesn't mean you're not going to be a good player. It just means you have slightly higher body fat, which as a youth athlete is going to be absolutely fine. So if you want to ask Sean when he's on about any more nutrition questions, please come back. But definitely not something I would worry about either way. OK, so let's see what other questions come in. Let's see what we've got. So we'll stick with the um, with the idea of working with youth athletes, but this is going to transfer across to everyone. So. Do you think it's better when you have burnout to invest in some hydrotherapy or Normatec compression boots? Um, so if you're defining burnout or as the same thing as what overtraining is, as doing so much training that your body struggles to adapt in the short term, and even over the mid to long term, you struggle to have a bounce back in terms of your performance, even after a good period of rest, then I would say you need to forget about any recovery modalities and you need to drastically reduce the amount of training you're doing. I don't want to say stop training because I obviously don't know exactly what your training schedule is like. And if you're in the match fit squad, we can go into more detail. But I think on this one, you're probably massively missing the point. Um, any recovery method is going to be one to 5% of our performance, maybe. Okay, so... We need to think about our training. We need to think about our schedule. So what are we actually doing in our training and how much? What's our training schedule like? Does it allow us to recover in the short and medium term to improve and get better? 
Um, is our nutrition really good? Okay, and if it is, it's going to support the training we're doing. Um, is our sleep really good? And does it support the training we're doing? And then are we doing what we need to do from a psychological perspective to make sure that we're fresh and ready to train again and we can deal with the stress of what training and competition gives us? So those five things there are going to be the majority of your success and the majority of your improvement, okay? That's so big. So often we think about tiny little things because we think we want to get 1% better and we think about marginal gains, if you've heard of it, is about trying to get the smallest percent of percentage of improvement out of everything, which in theory is great. But if we forget the massive things that are the most important, then the rest of it doesn't matter. So there's something called the Pareto Principle, which is basically that 20% of what we do gives us about 80% of our results. And we should really focus on nailing that 20%. So... Uh, if you don't train well and your training is not useful, then you won't get better. So if you worry about Norma Tech compression boots that a football club might have two sets of and they might put on some players because they like it, then you're going to be missing the point a little bit. OK, and we can definitely go into more detail on this type of stuff, but I wouldn't think about investing in in Norma Tech compression boots, unless you're a, a high level football club, um, for an individual to go out and buy Norma Tech boots, I think probably is missing the point and a bit over the top if you haven't absolutely nailed down your training, your nutrition, your sleep, and the big things that I've mentioned. Um, in terms of hydrotherapy, obviously a bath is going to be good enough, or often traveling teams will use dustbins. So whether they're English style up and down dustbins, or whether they're just like a plastic type of tub that you can use it's very, very cheap. You can probably go out and get one for 30 or 40 pound and you can just fill it up in your garden or wh wherever you are. So hydrotherapy really should be quite cheap. You don't need specialized equipment. Um, I wouldn't go for Norma Tech recovery boots unless you're a professional athlete at a very, very high level and you've got everything else under control. So Antonis, knowing your age, I really wouldn't worry about this stuff. And if you think that you wake up in the morning and you feel like you don't want to train or you don't have the energy to train, then don't go out and train. Maybe speak with some of your coaches or other players in your situation or your parents and make sure that you're doing the right thing for you as a person and not just you as a player. OK, if you get to the point where you can't get up in the morning and go out and train because you're so tired, you're definitely doing too much training. OK, OK. So please, please, please speak to your coaches and see if there's any way that you can try and have some rest or adapt your training schedule so that you can bounce back, okay? You need to worry about having a thousand good days in a row and not just one huge day and then you can't train for three or four days. So definitely try and speak to your coaches there. Okay, let's see what else we've coming in. Okay, so should you do any running work on the day you have a team session? And if there's not time after the team session, can you do it before? So it's a good question. And often people, due to the training situation, due to the pitch time or due to work or whatever it is, can't do extra work around the session. And they still want to get that work done within the week. So you definitely can do running work on the same day as you have a team training session. Um, how many hours? It's obviously good to do it as far away as possible from a team training session. So if you want to do a speed session and you go out and do it at 9 a.m. and then you have a pitch training session at 8 p.m., as long as the volume from that speed session is not huge, then it's not going to affect the training at night, assuming your nutrition is good throughout the day, okay? And generally you have a good lifestyle. So there's no problem with doing that. You definitely can. And in terms of speed work, you can definitely go out and do that straight before training as well. And if anything, it could potentially help you um, and probably prime you to be really quick and sharp in that training session. Again, as long as the volume is not huge. Where I'd be more concerned is if you're doing a stamina session, that's going to cause a lot of fatigue, um, especially if there are a lot of accelerations and decelerations that could potentially cause more fatigue and some muscle damage as well. Um, I'd be a bit more concerned, but as long as you don't have a huge training session on that day, 
again, as long as it's far away from the session or as far as away as it could be, and you have good nutrition and generally a good lifestyle, then I think you could, you could probably deal with that. The way I would look at my week is I would highlight my team training sessions and I would look at which ones tend to be harder and which one tend to be easier. And what I would do, I would try and do any stamina sessions or any double sessions on a day that I have an easier team training session, because that's probably going to mean that I can still perform well in my team training session. Um, the coach is going to be happy with me. I'm going to have a good performance, but I also got that additional work done. If you go out on a Friday morning and have a huge running session on your own, and then Friday night, you've got a huge team training session, then potentially those things are going to negatively impact each other. And you're going to have a bad training session at night, potentially, depending on what you're like as an athlete. So that's what I would think about. You definitely can do those things. I would just always worry about the amount of work you're doing and the amount of time. If you can get out in the morning and do your session in 45 minutes, fantastic. If you're out in the morning for three hours and then you've got training at night, probably not the best idea. So judge your situation and just go from there. Okay, so we are a classic questions about DOMS. So what are good ways to deal with DOMS? Um, and it made training much harder. So I'm sure we've all felt this. First thing I would do before even trying to decide how to deal with DOMS is reassess what you did in your training session that gave you DOMS for three days. Because unless you're in the off season or like you've got a preseason period where you can really afford to negatively impact your training, then you probably don't want to be doing training that gives you sore legs for three days. Um, so assess what you did. And potentially on paper, it might not look like very much. But what you might find is that they might have been uh, a drastic increase of workload that you're not used to. It might have been new movements that you're not used to. So really the lesson is to build up your training uh, volume over time. And if there are new movements that you think might cause you some soreness, then introduce them slowly in your training program, maybe as more assistance exercises or even as a warm up. Um, and that way you're going to be more accustomed to that movement later on. And it's going to cause next uh, a little bit less soreness. So obviously arrange your training in a way that doesn't cause too much DOMS. Once it's said and done, okay, what you're going to want to do is eat as much as possible, pretty much. And like I always say, you can talk to Sean about that. Okay. You need to have nutrition that supports your training. So if you do have DOMS for three days, it might suggest that some parts of your lifestyle are not as dialed in as they should be. Because if your nutrition is fantastic, then it's really going to help with that feeling of muscle soreness. Um, also, sleep is going to be huge as well. Um, it sounds like I'm always banging on about nutrition and sleep, but they are really, really important. So what you need to do is make sure your nutrition and sleep are on point, And that's going to be really helpful for, for those things. There's going to be nothing secret that you can do. Maybe you'll find that foam rolling helps you feel subjectively a little bit better. Maybe a massage will make you feel good. Um, I probably wouldn't recommend an ice bath um, because if you do have a large amount of soreness, I'm assuming you've done high volume work because you want to induce hypertrophy. So if you want that hypertrophy, probably stay away from recovery methods that might blunt that adaptation, but definitely make sure your nutrition is great. Your sleep is great and reassess what's going on um, about why you've had that DOMS in the first place. Okay. Let me see what else is coming in and we'll try and answer them the best as possible. Okay, so what do I think about having to train with a, a COVID mask? So I'm assuming you're talking about like any surgical mask or any kind of fabric mask and if it's dangerous. So definitely I don't think training with a mask is dangerous. I haven't heard any situation where a, a footballer or any type of athlete has had really negative effects or like passed out or anything like that. So from a safety perspective, I don't think it's a problem at all. Um, I know it's annoying and it's not something that most of us like to do. And I don't even like to coach when I'm wearing a mask. Obviously, I have to if I if I have to comply with that rule at the time, then obviously I will do. Uh, what I would say is that if you're allowed to wear 
any type of mask. So it doesn't have to be a legit surgical mask and it can be a fabric mask. So I've got one right here. So when I'm exercising or uh, coaching, if I'm allowed to and I'm outside, I'll just wear a fabric mask because it's much more breathable and should negatively impact. It, should, um, it shouldn't negatively impact your performance as much. Then I would definitely do that if you're allowed to. So it's not dangerous. If you have to wear a mask, obviously, please wear one. But wear a mask that's going to uh, negatively affect you a little bit less. And then you're probably going to find it much more breathable and much more tolerable as well. OK, so how can you improve the quality of your sleep? Fantastic, fantastic question. So there's a few recommendations and there's a few things you can do that are really simple. So making sure the room's as dark as possible is going to help a lot. And making sure things are quiet is going to help a lot. So I've always tried to get blackout blinds when I'm when it's possible. And for me, that makes a huge, huge difference and helps me sleep much better. You might have gone to a hotel before and it's had like really great blackout blinds and you feel like you don't want to wake up in the morning. So I think most people have had that feeling where they might have overslept when they're in a hotel. And usually it's because the blinds are really good. The second thing is noise. So you can use earplugs and not a lot of people do this, but I think it's really, really valuable. And once you're used to wearing a, a good quality earplug, then it's really easy to put in and it's not something you notice at all. So I think those two things are really easy wins and can make a big, big difference. There are other recommendations that sometimes are a little bit tougher. So often what, um, what people recommend is that your sleep space or your bedroom is used only for sleeping. And for a lot of people, that isn't something that's uh, possible. You might have a desk or you might live in a studio flat or you might have like a TV or it might be any type of space that you use frequently. So I think in an ideal world, you'll have a bedroom that literally is only used for sleeping, but sometimes not possible. Um, another recommendation, which I think is quite useful is if you do not use any electronics like your phone or a laptop or you don't watch any TV for around 30 minutes before bed. And that's because potentially blue light is something that keeps you alive, uh, keeps you awake. Um, and possibly you don't want that blue light. But I think a more obvious thing that it does, it helps your brain switch off a little bit. So obviously you want to be focused on or you don't want to focus, but you want to be relaxed before bed. If you're on Instagram or on Twitter or you're reading stuff or messaging your friends, your brain's going to be quite alert. So not using electronics 30 minutes before bed can be useful. And if that doesn't work or you struggle with that, then another way of trying to relax is reading before bed. Reading definitely can be quite useful. I know everyone in this chat has probably read a book at some point and wanted to fall asleep straight away. So whether that's because the book is boring or because we're just not used to reading and staying alert, um, that's another thing you can do before bed. So there are little things. There's other things around temperature. So keeping the room very cool and recommendations are obviously really uh, are sometimes really cold. Um, and I wouldn't recommend having a room that's really cold, even though it might help you sleep. You might get a cold and stuff like that. And not everyone has air conditioning and that much control. But generally making sure the room is cool and you're not too hot is going to be useful. So there's some really useful things that you can do that's going to massively help your sleep. And I know there are some issues with sleep qualities for any any type of athletes at any level, because if you play a game at night or if you have training at night, you're probably buzzing when you come home, even if you don't realize it. So meditation can be really good. So Headspace is just one of the, the big meditation apps. There are a bunch of other ones out there. Um, there's one called Calm, but literally if you search meditation apps, there's going to be so many. Um, a lot of them are free and that can be really useful. Um, and another thing you can do if you're a senior athlete. So I would recommend this for anyone who speaks to their doctor and anyone who's over age, over age 18. There are natural supplements you can take. There's also melatonin. Melatonin in the UK has to be prescribed by a doctor. In a lot of other countries, melatonin doesn't have to be subscribed, uh, prescribed and is over the counter. So melatonin has been shown to work in people that struggle with sleep, but I definitely would only 
recommend that if you've seen a doctor and you're over the age of 18. So many different things that you can do to help your sleep and it's going to have a huge impact on performance, okay? A huge, huge impact. And just off the back of that, is it bad if you have your phone in your room? Not at all. Obviously, I think the majority of people use their phone as a, as an alarm. And if you didn't, you wouldn't wake up to go to training or you'd be late for games. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. But if you can and you do have the self-discipline, just set your alarm and leave it alone somewhere where you can't see it for as long as possible before bed. Um, but yeah, definitely... I wouldn't throw your phone away if you don't have an alarm clock. Obviously, you need the balance there and be able to wake up. So we definitely got some stuff out there around sleep as well. Um, and you, if you've got any other questions, you can ask in the Match Fit squad. So I'll just bring this to an end, guys. I think it's been it's been really useful. And we've touched on some different stuff to what we normally touch on, which has been great. So if you've got any more specific questions, um, you can get us in the Match Fit squad. Or you can wait till uh, Jared, Sean and Barney are on as well. And we love your questions. Please think about what you want to ask in advance. Get them in the chat early. And that way I can have a quick look at them and see what ones might be the most useful. And that way I can make sure I can help as many people as possible. So really enjoyed it today. Thanks for all your questions. And hopefully I'll speak to you soon, whether it's in the squad or whether it's here next week. So I hope everyone has a good day. Everyone has a good week. Train as hard as you can. Make sure you recover well. Eat a lot, sleep a lot, and then hopefully we'll all have a good training week. So I'll see you guys soon.